In September 1973, the women of Brookside, Kentucky defied traditional gender roles and became activists in the Harlan County Coal Strike. Their responsibilities to their culture and their families to protect the rights of coal miners pushed these women out of the kitchen and onto the forefront of a national battle that would have a lasting impact on grassroots activism in Appalachia. They were front and center in getting the message out and representing, uh, they added an extra dimension to the appeal that this, this struggle had to people outside the region. But they, they also seem to have a pretty savvy knowledge of how to mobilize public opinion. Uh, and they did that, and that did set an example. This local labor dispute was between the Brookside Miners, backed by the United Mine Workers of America, a national union, on one side and on the other side, Norman Yarbrough, president of Eastover Mining Company, a subsidiary of Duke Power, the sixth largest privately owned power company in the United States. These women are famous for joining the men on the picket line after Judge F. Bird Hawk, a local judge and a well-known coal operator, passed an injunction that limited the number of miners on the picket line. This allowed temporary workers, known as scabs, to easily cross the picket line, continuing the flow of coal, threatening miners' jobs, and limiting the chance of a contract settlement. So when we had our march and seen all those men working, we decided we'd just put a stop to it because there was no point in men sitting down there and somebody else up on the hill working. Well, you're never going to get a contract like that. The women were fighting for the miners' right to choose their own union, the United Mine Workers of America. This right is protected under Section 7 of the National Labor Relations Act. Even though the miners chose the United Mine Workers of America to negotiate a contract with Duke Power Company, Eastover, their subsidiary, deliberately avoided coming to terms with the union on any kind of collective bargaining agreement. The Brookside women also felt it was their responsibility to become involved in the Brookside strike because their lives and the lives of their families were dependent on Duke Power Company. With a United Mine Workers of America contract, their families would have medical care, life insurance, death benefits, and a pension fund. We have to fight for our rights. You're going to have to fight for that. If you have more safety in the mines, if you get your portal to portal pay, if you have your doctor card, you can be doctor. Because if you get disabled and you don't have any backing, then some home will get you or your family will get <coughs> well, For one thing, it'll mean hospitalization for our families. For another, the most important thing I think is safety to the miners, you know, uh, we all want our husbands with us when we get old, if it's any way possible. The Brookside women were fighting for the right to safer working conditions in the mines. Women all over the country are interested in what their husbands are doing. They're interested in the safety laws that the United Mine Workers have. And they want their husbands to have the pension funds. They don't want their husbands going into these scab mines with a rock of falling and running these your motors with no brakes. So they want to participate. They're ready and willing. Even though the Federal Mine and Safety Act of 1969 made mine safety a right of coal miners and a responsibility of the coal company, the Brookside Mine was still very dangerous. Although Norman Yarbrough, president of East River Mining Company, claimed that Brookside was one of the safest mines in the country, a federal safety inspection found 72 safety violations, ranging from water above miners' knees and parts of the mine to mining equipment that lacked brakes and lights. The women felt it was their responsibility to organize their own grassroots campaign, publishing their own newsletter, and leading marches as a part of their culture of resistance against the coal company. The women and their families have been disempowered by coal companies since the Industrial Revolution. The way the industry developed at that time, with a powerless group of people, were the workers and the very powerful group of people who, uh, who owned the, uh, the capital resources created um, uneven ground. 
It created this unequal society uh, that uh, has plagued the mountains, I think, ever since the turn of the 20th century. These women had also heard stories of the infamous Bloody Harlan strikes of the 1930s from their family members and the importance of having a strong union in the mine. That was mostly what we talked about, sitting around the table after supper and all. Most of our conversation was his union, you know, when he was organizing for the union and things that happened on the picket line and things that the company did to you. And so I began to hate the company, you know. Uh, I mean, that seemed like I just always did. I knew they were enemy, you know. Even though the miners and the United Mine Workers of America officials believed that it was the women's responsibility to participate in the strike, Eastover officials did not agree. Well, they certainly played a big role in it. Uh, I would hate to think that my wife would play this kind of role. Uh, Why? Well, there's been, uh, there's been some conduct that I don't like to think that our American women uh, uh, have to, to revert to. The social changes of the late 1960s had changed the roles of Appalachian women in activism. I think there were so many different movements going on in the 1960s. Uh, you had labor movements. Labor was still pretty strong. But you also had the civil rights movement, which was huge. And you had the women's movement as well. Uh, you had gay rights movements. So the 60s was a very fertile time of, for social change, and people began to assert themselves. And I think that Appalachian people started to say, hey, wait a minute, we've been treated like a minority too. Norman Yarbrough believed that the women were not on the picket line to protect miners' rights. He claimed that the women were paid by the United Mine Workers of America to be on the picket line and not a part of a grassroots campaign. The women are just getting paid. Of course, the, the more the women done, the more the woman got paid. It was a bonus set up thing. And they were shelling out the money here. It's not money. Uh, none of us women ain't had no pay for going We've on. We've had no pay, right. but they just can't seem to understand that, that people can't feel strong enough about anything if they'll stand up there without your loading their pockets with money. And he claimed that they were just seeking public attention. They were trying to be somebody. There never been nobody except maybe a coal miner's wife or a coal miner or something like that. And they, they enjoyed that national attention. There's a lot of them that looks down their nose at you and and think you're just out there to show off and want people to see you and stuff like that. Uh, we're just bored housewives, you know, uh, looking for excitement. And uh, uh, there's no, uh, nobody would go down there for excitement. I mean, when you pick it, that's every day's business. During the strike, the women were assaulted and harassed by company hired gun thugs on and off the picket line. They were also denied their legal right of a trial by jury, arrested and fined under false charges. Eventually, the Brookside women's hard work and sacrifice paid off when on August 29, 1974, East River Mining Company and Duke Power signed the United Mine Workers of America contract. Their work also had a long-term impact on the responsibilities of Appalachian women and activism to protect the rights of their families and communities. The Brookside women went on to fight against the Ku Klux Klan organized for black lung legislation and led a national campaign against Duke Power Company's harsh treatment of minors and their families. Their activism also encouraged the women of Appalachia to become coal miners, which resulted in a significant increase of the number of female miners. Women have a tendency to fight not just for themselves, but for their families, for their communities, and I think once they saw themselves in those leadership positions, uh, that changed. They couldn't go back to the kitchen. I've always stayed home and tried to be a good wife and good mother, and I've always gone to church and tried to do the right thing. But you know, there comes a time when you have to stand up. And this is my time, and I'm going to stand up. Come on, you coal miners, wherever you may be. And listen to a story that I'll relate to thee. My name is nothing extra, but the truth to you I'll tell. I am a coal miner's wife, I'm sure I wish you well.